Well, good. And shouldn't you be at work already? That was tiring. Here's the thing. No, it's not what you think. These back suspension arms and these Mark 5 Mondeos, when you get high mileage, I'm talking about 150 to 200,000 miles plus, you're going to get a bit of, you're going to get a bit of that. And I'm going to show you what it is. Now I have pointed out in the past, I even I actually made a video on this, that these rear anti-roll bar debushes can cause a creaking from the rear suspension on these Mark V Mondeos. But the roll bar bushes aren't actually that bad. The noise we're dealing with today is fecking biblical. Let me put it in layman's terms for you. If you were driving this car down the road, people would literally stop on the sidewalk turn around and stare at you, wondering what the hell was rolling down the road. That's how bloody bad it is. And I'm telling you, this is becoming quite a common problem now. I will say though, usually the car has to have done at least over 150,000 miles. This one is on 255,000 miles, so it ain't done bad. Anyway, I'm not going to show you the exact bush until I get the arm off, but you have to take, we have to take the complete suspension arm off the back of this car, then I'll show you what's going on. I'll tell you what though, these blue gloves, they're not very good. They're dog shit actually. The first thing is these anti-roll bar links. I seriously suggest getting a wire brush and getting all the rust off them. And then spray a little bit of free and all penetrating oil on the threads. 18 mil nuts, I'm just gonna see if they come straight off. No, they're spinning. I'm just gonna hold the collar of these links with a pair of mold grips. There is an Allen key bit you could put in there, undo them nuts with a spanner if you wanted to. But it's 18 mil. It. and we're going to take both of these off and that's it you need to get this anti-roll bar link completely out of the way okay i'm just going to run a stand underneath this bottom arm just to take the weight off the shock absorber just a little bit the reason is the shock absorber needs to be removed chances are you'll find the bolts they're 18 mil by the way they're covered in lumps of crap which you'll have to scrape off and then you can just whack them out. There. Right then. You can let the stand right down now. It's actually not going to go anywhere. Yeah. Two 15 mil bolts holding the bottom of the shock absorber on. They'll come out quite easily. There, that's our shock absorber right out of the way. Because if you don't take it out of the way, it will be in the way. Actually, I don't know why I took this away earlier, because I'm just going to put this back under here for the moment, because I'm going to undo some of these bolts. bolts. By the way, before I go any further, all the bolts that I'm about to undo, I have cleaned the threads that I can see with a wire brush as best as I can get on them and I've sprayed them bits of threads with freeing oil, just to help them along their way. So first up at the rear of the arm, that's a 21 mil bolt. Bingo. There's a track arm which connects to our hub here, 
This nut is actually welded onto this like washer with a tab that bends over. So we don't need to put anything on that. So that's 15 mil bolt. There you go. There's an 18 mil bolt here, like a goes on a stabilizer bar. I'm gonna use a ratchet, a big half inch drive ratchet to undo this because I can't fit the air gun in there. Yeah! Well, it's undone. There we go. Yeah. If it will come out. There. The whole hub should be quite loose now. Notice that track arm has got quite a bit of tension on it, but the stabiliser bar push there. You can get a lever and you can pull that out now. Right, it's fun and games time now because there's two big bolts that hold the inner part of this arm to the bloody frame. And I'm telling you, if you don't put freeing oil on them and clean up the threads, you could have problems getting them out. In fact, I'm going to try and do this, not with an air gun, but we just have a bar to start with to see if it will move. Christ! It's moved and it actually feels okay. Now that's loosened, I'm going to see if I can get the rest of it out of the air gun. The problem now, because we've got the weight of that spring pushing the arm down, the bolt's sort of like tight to get out. So I'm going to try and jack this arm up, take the weight off it. Just there, now I can pull that bolt out, see? I've taken the weight off the spring. There you go. We're down to the last bolt now, this big 24 mil bolt, okay? It's got a captive nut that's welded to the chassis, to the actual frame on the other side. And I've had them nuts on the other side break off where these bolts are so tight, they get rusty. That's why I said clean them threads up. Anyhow, let's actually see if this one moves. Flipping it. Yeah. yeah, it was tight, but it's moved. If you have a stand underneath this arm and you jack it just to the right position, you'll get it so that that bolt's free and you can pull it straight out. There. Once again, I'm going to take this stand right out of the way now. Now it's the tricky bit, because I've actually, I could pull this down with a lever. All I've got to do now is get the spring out. I could, if I wanted to, unbolt the actual frame from the actual chassis. But if you don't want to do that, I'm just going to use a bar and I'm going to hook the spring out. Where the back bolt went through that arm, you see the arms drop down as well. That's all helping, it's making the spring have less tension on it. Let's see if I can hook this spring out, whether it's going to give me grief. There we go. Bingo. Tell you something, you wouldn't want to drop that on your foot. <laughs> because this whole hub is in our way, and believe me, it is in the way, I've got a jack under here, and I'm going to just jack this hub up nice and high so it's out of the frigging way. There. And now the best policy here is just to try and wriggle this arm out how best you can. There. That's it. And there it is. This is the bush that's causing all the trouble. This is what's making all the creaking noise. And I'll tell you what, I don't know what it is, but this kind of bush, I don't know whether it's oil filled or what, but it's really like, feels like jelly, if you know what I mean. And when they're, in the, when they're actually in the car, if you notice the way they sit on the frame, they sit at an angle like that. It's a bit peculiar. Anyway. This is one of these bushes I pulled out of an old arm. They do press out. In actual fact, they don't press out too badly either. But here's the problem. 
as far as I can make out, you can't buy these bushes. I'm telling you, I've looked, I've looked everywhere and I cannot find these bushes. Nobody sells them. eBay, if you go to Ford, they want to sell you a complete arm, complete with bushes, over 300 pound. But, unless you can get a second hand arm from somewhere, what I've done in the end, because I can't get no second hand arms, I reckon, <laughs> I reckon they've all been sold, all the ones that were scrap anyway. And there again, if a second hand arm, you don't know what you're getting, you might, be, you might get a crap one anyway. I went to Ford Direct off eBay, link in the description below, and I'll show you the part number, £207 for a complete arm, which is still bloody extortion, but it was the best deal I could get at the time. <laughs> yeah, look at that, isn't that nice and shiny? <laughs> £207 for a rubber bush, woohoo! There we go. <laughs> Isn't that nice? There's a piece of rubber that the spring sits in at the bottom, which sits in the bottom, the bottom of this arm. It's got little like notches on it, which fit into a hole in the arm, so you can only get it in one way. Don't forget to refit that in this new arm. And unfortunately, if you're trying to put this back by yourself, you're just gonna have to wriggle it in the same way you wriggled it out. So, uh, good luck. The rear bush on this arm, just to note here, because it sits, it can move about. If I can get it out. See, it moves about. You'd have to get that like flat, so it'll literally slide up in this channel. Because if it goes in pissed, you're not going to get it in properly. See what I mean? Before you get anything bolted onto this bloody arm, make sure that both these back rearward bushes are in place, especially this one. You'd have to slot it through the bottom of the frame and slide it up like that. It would probably be worth all these bolts, if there's any rust on them, get it all cleaned up now before you put them back in. And if you want to put some grease on the bolt threads so they don't seize up again anytime soon, that's up to you. I'm going to get this rear bush bolt in first before I put the spring in because this is the most difficult one to get in. And I'll make sure that's started on the threads properly. Right, I've got that bolt nearly all the way in, but I'm not going to tighten it up. In fact, I'm going to get all the bolts in, but I'm not going to tighten any of the bolts up until everything is in properly. The next trick is to fit the spring. The spring, actually the bottom coil, it will butt up in that rubber mount in a certain position. There's like a notch, like a step. So you can only put the spring in in one position. But I'll fit the top in first, like so. And now it's just a case of using the lever bar to push it into place. Yeah! There we go. Oh, it's in. <laughs> yeah, watch your fingers. <laughs> now I'm going to let this stand down now because I don't, the hub's not going to be a problem now. So I'll bring the hub right down and this stand can go towards this front bush, or well, well, rear bush. So I'm going to pump the stand up, whoop, there it goes and try and level that, that hole up, then we can get our bolt through. If I get my bar on there, I'll get the thread started. That's actually, that's on the thread, so I can feel it going in nicely. Yeah, baby. Things are going, going right today. I don't think I need to show you how the rest of this connects up. It's all straightforward, nuts and bolts. So I'm gonna connect all the bolts in, Make sure everything's on the thread properly, then I'll tighten everything up. Right, all the bolts are in, they're all nipped up very lightly. I'll get the stand out of the way. And now it's just a case of tightening all the bolts up. I'm going to use like a big half inch bar to do them up by hand rather than use an air gun. Flipping it! Yeah! That's tight. Nutter! Yeah! 
Just one little tip here. When it comes to refitting the rear shock absorber, you want to put it back the way you took it off, i.e. fit this part in the bottom arm first, get the two 15mm bolts started into these through the arm first, okay? Then fit the top two 18mm bolts onto the body. Because if you put these top ones in first, you will struggle getting these in because of the angle the shock absorber is going to sit at and you've got a high chance of cross-threading these, these bloody bolts. So put this in first. And obviously you'd have to put a stand underneath the bottom arm just to raise it up enough so these top two 18mm bolt holes line up. I've just had to swap ramps because the ramp inside the workshop was actually needed for something more important. So I've put this car now in the shed, which I'll show you in a minute which is outside. This arm is all bolted back up. I've gone over all the bolts twice, tightened them all up by hand, and roll bar drop links back on. Everything's good. So all I can say now, this is the last time this arm's gonna look like this. In fact, the next time this car comes in for a service, it's gonna look shitty, just like this one. By the way, if you want to know what the yellow chalk is for, when the tyres on these cars get really low, when we check them, and they need replacing, we chalk them so the tyre fitters up our sales garage know what tyres to replace. Here we go. This is the moment of truth. <laughs> I can't hear nothing. Of course it's bloody well all right. Flipping heck. You don't spend over 200 pound on a piece of aluminium monkey metal with a bit of rubber in it and think it's not gonna work, do you? Anyway, let me get on. That's that job done. I've got something else to show you, which actually, I think is gonna be pretty useful to know. And the funny thing is, I'll explain when I get there. This way. Here's a little tip for you for today. There are three fundamental tools you should be carrying around with you all the time. In your car, that is. A hammer, a pair of mole grips, and a good old flat-bladed screwdriver. So why would you carry them tools in your car? Well, I'm gonna tell you. Picture this. You're on your way to the seaside. Sunny honey, hey, maybe Great Yarmouth, the Blackpool of the East Coast. Jesus, I can remember those days well. The early 90s, Ford Cortina Mark III, California chrome wheels, pearlescent paint, cruising up and down the Golden Mile with all the lights and glitz of the casinos. Anyway, we're not there yet. You've stopped off halfway at the motorway services. You've probably been ripped off for a plate of chips, and when you come out, your bloody car won't start. Or, worse still, you could be stuck in a lay-by somewhere with a wife and six kids, all getting very agitated that you're not going anywhere. And then you've got to, then you've got to break the news to your wife that you don't have any recovery insurance, and you wonder how domestic incidents can escalate. Anyway, my, my sole purpose today is to offer a glimmer of light that may get you out of a shitty situation. And it involves one of these three tools. Come and have a look at this. Ah! This is the starter motor out of a Mark V Mondeo 2 litre diesel. Now what you've got to understand here is, 
We have over 100 of these cars running as taxis day and night, okay, for the last three or four years. So when things go wrong and you get common problems on these cars, I tend to know about it. Now, Monday morning, there was a car parked in the yard. It was one of our taxis. No note, no nothing. I went out to it. I put my foot on the clutch because as you know, you've got to put your foot down on the clutch. Otherwise the engine won't start when you turn the ignition key. I turned the ignition key and there was nothing there. I could hear a faint click of a relay, which I guess was the starter relay but the car would not crank over. And do you know what? Rather than sort of like go, oh my God, or go grab for the scanner or a test light to go probing electrical terminals, I instinctively knew exactly what the problem probably was. And I got the car started within the space of less than a minute. And I'm gonna show you what was wrong with this car and how you can get yourself out of the shit. Also, that morning, was like a deja vu moment as well. Because no sooner than I started that car, I came back in here, the phone rang, and somebody from another taxi firm was on the phone with the same problem, asking me what could be the problem. So I said what I'd just done, and he came back to me later and said, yeah, guess what? That was my problem as well. <laughs> so, anyway, let me show you what's wrong with this starter motor. I've positioned this starter motor as if you were looking from underneath the bonnet down onto it. There are two solenoids in this starter. This top one is the one we're interested in. So if you're looking at this starter motor from underneath the bonnet, you'll see, you'll see this 10 mil nut on this solenoid and there'll be a lead coming off this, okay? Now also you'll see this little tab here. Now what you need to do is get your screwdriver that you should be carrying around with you and I want you to bridge the screwdriver from that 10 mil nut onto that terminal there. All right, just bridge it like that and have somebody crank the engine over. And if it starts up, you know that your starter motor is at fault. And so you can see exactly what the problem here is. And this is like, it's like an Achilles heel of these starter motors. I will say though, generally these don't go wrong until well over 100,000 miles of use but they are becoming more and more common. You have to remove that 10 mil, and then underneath that 10 mil, there'll be a little tab. Now all this tab does, it connects this terminal here to the actual, this terminal with a solenoid. And I should be able to hook the other half of that tab off. Yep, yeah. whoop. And that's all the problem is. That little terminal snaps just there. And I've, do you know what? I've had flipping loads of them do this now. So I mean, you could, you could actually, you could make your own terminal now to repair that starter motor if you wanted to. On the, most of the cars we do, they're getting up for like 200,000 miles. So we, we just replace the starters anyway, because if you get a starter motor to do that kind of mileage, it, you're probably best just replacing it. But if you had a low mileage starter motor, it might be worth trying to repair that. So, uh, that's all I've really got to say on the matter. You know, something needs to be done about that bloody ringtone. Garage? Alan, do you remember those port cutters I lent you? Yes, you did. And do you also remember they have a back to them? Ah, uh, yeah. Well, can I have them back then? Money, I'll run them up to you straight away. <sighs> Things I have to do. No, I do not recommend carrying these around in your car. Molly! There's your old car. 
got as many. Cheers. See ya. Whoa! You're right. You left your hat here, though. Yeah, I'm fine. By the way, why do you carry them bolt cutters around with you? Alan, I have very big toenails to cut. I don't get it. Anyway, till the next time. See ya!